everyone. Today a video looking at NMR spectroscopy and in particular an introduction to it, the theory and carbon-13 NMR. So many nuclei that have odd mass numbers such as hydrogen, H1, carbon-13, nitrogen-15, fluorine-19 have a property called spin, uh, as do electrons. Now this gives them a magnetic field like that of a bar magnet. A really simple analogy for thinking about spin is to think of it as essentially looking like a bar magnet. Now if I take bar magnets and I place them into an external magnetic field, they will line up naturally parallel to that field. So if we have a, a look on the right, we have this sort of schematic drawn out. We have our external magnetic field, our north and south um, bar magnets at the top and bottom. And then we have our individual bar magnets in the middle, and we can see that they can line up parallel to the field. So the north and south poles kind of meet together and are attracted together. Now, it's also possible that the bar magnets could line up anti-parallel to the field. Now, this orientation obviously has a much higher energy because we know that the, the same type of pole, so north and north and south and south, repel. And so these bar magnets have to be forced into this anti-parallel position against the repulsion of the external magnetic field. So that's a much higher energy uh, scenario. Now, the stronger the external magnetic field and the stronger the magnets are, the larger that energy gap between the parallel and the anti-parallel states will be. And I've shown this on a, an energy diagram on the right here, I have energy up the y-axis, and then you can see we have our lower energy parallel state, our higher energy anti-parallel state, and we have this difference in energy delta E between the two states. The stronger the external magnetic field and the stronger the actual magnetic strength of the, of the magnets, um, the bigger this energy gap will be. Now, a similar situation applies to nuclei that have this property called spin. Now, you'll notice earlier on we talked about the key thing is that they, uh, many of them with odd mass numbers. So it's not necessarily um, the, the most common one that we find on the periodic table. For example, it's carbon-13, not carbon-12, nitrogen-15, not nitrogen-14. But there are some that we do just naturally find on the periodic table. So fluorine-19, for example, hydrogen-1. But these, this situation of this uh, parallel and anti-parallel states applies to nuclei with spin. There are some of each nuclei in, in, each of the, in each of the states. So if we take, for example, let's say we're talking about carbon-13, there will be some of the carbon-13 nuclei in the lower parallel state, there'll be some in the anti-parallel state. And there'll always be more in that lower energy parallel one. You can think of it being easier to populate that state because it's of a lower energy. But if we provide electromagnetic energy that is just equal in energy to the difference between the two states, if I supply energy that is exactly equal to that delta E value, well, some nuclei can flip between the positions. If we go back to that analogy of the bar magnets, this essentially is then flipping from the parallel to the anti-parallel. We can think of it here really as being the spin flipping. And this, uh, this idea where these nuclei flip between the parallel and anti-parallel states is something called resonance. Now, the energy required to cause this is in the radio waves region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the frequency of the radio waves that are required to cause the flipping for a specific nucleus, to cause it to go from the parallel to the anti-parallel state, is called the resonant frequency. Now, the higher the frequency, the larger the energy gap. If you remember the equation that E is equal to H nu, where E is the energy, H is Planck's constant, and nu, the Greek symbol, is uh, for the, uh, the uh, frequency. So the bigger the frequency, the larger that energy gap between the two states is. Now, the really, really key thing is that different atomic nuclei will come into resonance. Their resonant frequency, this frequency that causes the flipping between the two states, will be different for different atomic nuclei, uh, because it essentially depends on the strength of their atomic magnets that are internal to them. And so what that means is that this resonant frequency for a carbon-13 nucleus is different to a proton, a H+, uh, an H1, sorry, nucleus. It's different to a 15 nitrogen nucleus, different to a 19 fluorine nucleus. Now, in simple terms, I've drawn the schematic here for uh, when we do this, this NMR experiment. What we have is our external magnetic field, 
which we normally apply around our, our sample. That's our north-south magnet that you see there around the sample. So we apply our external magnetic field. We then have our radio frequency source. That's what fires our radio waves at our sample to cause these transitions between the parallel and anti-parallel states. Um, and this radio frequency source is typically applied at right angles to that external magnetic field. This generates the energy change in the nuclei of the sample. It flips them between the parallel and the anti-parallel um, states if it matches that difference in energy. And this can be detected. As the way that happens is, let's say we have some in the parallel state. The radio waves come in. They have that energy to cause the flipping between the parallel and anti-parallel states. It causes some of them to move up to the anti-parallel state. But then after a period of time, they're going to relax back down. They're going to fall back down into the parallel state. And by moving back down, it emits electromagnetic energy itself. And that's what we detect at our radio detector. And then this can then be connected up to a, a computer display. It can be interpreted by a computer to produce the spectrum. So as we said, it was for nuclei that quite often have odd mass numbers. So carbon-12, with its even mass number of 12, doesn't possess this like doesn't possess an overall nuclear spin, but carbon 13 does. Now carbon 13 is, is an isotope of carbon, but actually only about 1% of carbon is actually carbon 13. However, today's instruments are actually sensitive enough to be able to record the carbon 13 spectrum, even though it's only 1% of it is going to be carbon 13, we can actually do it. Now not only is it useful to know that different nuclei have different resonant frequencies, so for example we could tell whether we have hydrogen nuclei, carbon-13 nuclei, nitrogen-15, fluorine-19, but actually within a particular um, element essentially, so in this case let's take the carbon atoms, not all of the carbon atoms in a molecule resonate at exactly the same magnetic field strength. They don't necessarily all have that same resonant frequency. Now, carbon atoms that are in different functional groups, in different parts of the molecule, feel the magnetic field differently. So remember, we apply that magnetic field to our sample. Depending on where the carbon atoms are in our molecule, they feel that magnetic field differently. The strength of it is slightly different. Now, all the nuclei get shielded from the external magnetic field by the electrons that surround them. And so there's a, sort of a diagram of this here at the bottom that if we just had an isolated proton, we have our external magnetic field, that's B0. And so the nucleus would just feel B0. However, when we have something surrounded by electron density, well, our electron is, we can imagine, sort of circulating around this, this proton. That generates its own magnetic field, an induced magnetic field. And the actual direction for this magnetic field is to oppose the original external magnetic field. So you have your original magnetic field, B0. This induced magnetic field from the electron is pointing in the opposite direction. And so overall, that proton feels slightly less of the external magnetic field. And so therefore, we say that it is shielded from the external magnetic field. And so nuclei that have more electrons around them uh, are better shielded. And so what we're, what we're really looking for is, well, what's the electron density around a particular carbon atom? If there's more electron density around it, the smaller the magnetic field, it will feel. And so it resonates at a lower frequency. Now, the NR instrument will produce a graph of energy absorbed from our radio signal against a quantity called something called chemical shift. Now, this just simply relates essentially to the resonant frequency. Now, chemical shift is measured in units of parts per million, ppm, and it's from a defined zero value, which is related to a compound called tetramethyl siling, TMS. And so the chemical shift is related in the difference in frequency between the resonating nucleus and TMS. So TMS is, is given the zero value, and then we see, well, OK, what's the difference in the frequency compared to that zero value? What's the shift of it, essentially, from zero? So a high resonant frequency, i.e. it's less shielded by electrons, it feels a much greater magnetic field, this means it will go at a, a, a much higher ppm value on our spectrum. So typically this idea of kind of the resonant frequency and this chemical shift are essentially the same thing in terms of whether they're higher or lower. So a higher resonant frequency is a higher ppm value, a higher chemical shift value.
and that means that it's less shielded by electrons because it feels a greater magnetic field. So, if we start to look at an example, here's a, the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for propanone, a ketone. Now, while you might look at this and think, oh, there's three carbon atoms, therefore I'll expect to see three peaks, you'll see that actually in our spectrum we only see two peaks. And so carbon atoms that are what we can call different environments will give different chemical shift values and therefore we'll be able to see them as different peaks in an NMR spectrum. Now generally, if we have electronegative atoms, remember that electronegative atoms we can think of as, as pulling the electrons in a covalent bond towards themselves more, they attract those electrons towards themselves to a greater extent. And therefore, if they do that, for example, if I have a carbon oxygen like I have in this propanone, the electrons are very strongly drawn towards that central oxygen and away from the carbon atom it's also bonded to. Now what this does is it essentially moves the electron density away from that carbon atom towards the oxygen, and so therefore we have less electron density around our carbon, and therefore we are de-shielding the carbon, and therefore it resonates at a higher frequency because it feels more of the external magnetic field, and therefore we know that it will resonate at a higher uh, higher frequency and therefore a greater chemical shift. It'll be higher up on this chemical shift ratio. So if we look at a sample of propanone, we can see that we have, I've labelled them as carbons 1 and 2. Carbon 2 is the, the one that I've labelled there for that carbonyl group, the CO double bond. And you can see that the peak for carbon number 2 is much, much, much higher than it is for carbon number 1. So it's showing you that that carbon is much more de-shielded, less electron density around it, uh, and therefore it's going to feel a much greater magnetic field, resonate at a higher frequency, and therefore give a higher chemical shift value. Now the other thing to be really keen about here is that there are actually only two carbon environments. And the way to think of this sometimes is about the symmetry of the molecule. Our propanone has a line of symmetry directly through the middle of that molecule. Imagine going straight through the middle of that CO double bond. That molecule is symmetrical around that point. And so the carbon atoms that are on either side that I've labelled number one are actually the same. They're in the same environment, we'd say, from an NMR perspective. And so one of the ways to look at it is to think, is there symmetry in the molecule? If there is, well, the things that are on the same, on opposite sides that are symmetric will be in the same environment. Another way to think about it is to imagine yourself standing on one of those carbons. So let's say we stand on the left-hand carbon. If I look to my left, I would see a hydrogen atom. If I look above and below hydrogen atoms, and if I look to my right, I have my carbonyl group attached to another uh, CH3 group. If I go to my other carbon atom, well, if I look around that one as well, do I see exactly the same thing? And actually, yes, I do. If I look one way, I see a hydrogen. If I look up and down, I see a hydrogen. If I look the other way, I see the carbonyl group, and I see uh, a CH3 group. So because I essentially see the same thing from both sides of this uh, molecule, again that relates to it being symmetric, therefore we only have the one environment for both of those. And so you can see in our, our total NMR spectrum here we have typically the, the y-axis sometimes isn't labelled at all but sometimes it is as energy absorbed. The really key one is the x-axis, our chemical shift in parts per million. Um, and then we have three peaks. So we have TMS, that was our reference, tetramethyl silane, it's given the zero value. We then have our peak for carbon number, uh, carbon number one and our peak for carbon number two. Remember that carbon number two has a much higher chemical shift because it's a much more de-shielded carbon atom due to the electronegative oxygen pulling electron density away. It therefore feels a much higher magnetic field strength, resonates at a higher frequency and therefore a higher chemical shift. And notice the symbol for the chemical shift. It's the same symbol that we see for when we talk about delta positive and delta negative charges sometimes. It's that delta symbol that we give for, for chemical shift. Now in the exam, you'll also be given uh, tables of chemical shift data. So here I've given the table here for, for carbon-13. Essentially what it tells you is, well, if we have a specific type of carbon, so typically this is involved in what kind of functional group the carbon is involved in, but really we're also talking about what environment the carbon is in, these will resonate at sometimes specific chemical shifts. So we can see here that if we have, for example, an alcohol or an ester down towards the middle, 
that we're told that kind of, um, if we have a carbon in that kind of environment, it will resonate between 50 and 90 ppm. If we have an alkene, for example, we're told that those carbon atoms will resonate between 90 and 150. And so again, this all goes back to what type of functional group our carbon is in, what environment it is in, and really to do with quite often the electronegativity of what it's attached to. So you can see right down at the bottom, we have sort of carbon-carbon single bonds down at 5 to 40. And as we go up, we have sort of carbons bonded to nitrogens, carbon bonded to oxygens. Carbonyl groups involved, these will go to higher chemical shifts because they are more de-shielded and therefore feel, feel a higher magnetic field, higher resonant frequency, higher chemical shift. So to look at some specific examples, here we have the spectrum for propanal, the aldehyde. There are three different um, environments in this molecule. Again, we can think of looking at this molecule. Is it symmetric at any point? Well, actually, in this molecule, no. There's no kind of, of line that we can draw where we end up with a, a symmetric, uh, sort of like a mirror image of either side. And so each of these carbons, we say, is in a different environment. If I was to stand on each of these carbons, there's no way that I would see the same thing looking from, from different carbons in different directions. And so all of these carbons are in different environments, so we're expecting to see three peaks. Clearly, the most de-shielded of these will be the aldehyde group, the COH group. At the, at the end, what I've labelled carbon number three. Clearly, this will be the most de-shielded because it's directly bonded to an electronegative atom. If we go back to that table on the previous slide, we see that the ones that are higher up in the chemical shift tend to be either directly bonded to an electronegative atom or bonded to another carbon atom that is bonded to an electronegative atom. So essentially, in some cases, just being close to an electronegative atom can also be uh, able to de-shield it. And so this carbon, I've labelled number three, very de-shielded because it's bonded to the electronegative oxygen that draws the electron density away from the carbon atom. And therefore, it's going to feel a higher magnetic field, higher resonant frequency, and hence a higher chemical shift value. And you can see here that the carbon number three would be the peak that's about 205 uh, ppm, very, very high up. We then have our two other carbons, so carbon number two, carbon number one. Um, and as I just said, essentially, we don't necessarily have to be directly bound to an electronegative atom. We can be uh, have a carbon atom that's then bonded to another carbon atom that's bonded to the electronegative atom, essentially just being closer to an electronegative atom. And clearly, the carbon number two is closer to that electronegative oxygen than carbon number one is. And so we would expect that the shift for carbon number two is slightly higher than for carbon number one. Not by particularly too much, but certainly it would be higher. And that's what we expect. Uh, that's what we end up seeing. So the peak for carbon number two is at about sort of 40 ppm. The one for carbon number one is at about 5 ppm. So it doesn't have to be directly bound to an electronegative group. It can just be near to it. Now, one thing that I would always say is to always draw out the displayed formula um, for NMR problems to seal the environment. So don't try and just write them out as structural formulas or even do it from the formula of a compound. Always draw out the full displayed formula to be able to see all the different environments that are there. We then have something called toluene. This is uh, methyl benzene. So if we look at our methyl benzene molecule, what we're expecting here is five carbon environments. And so again, we can think about the symmetry of the molecule. Is there any way that this is a symmetric molecule? And well, yes, there is if we go directly down the middle of this molecule. So if we imagine having a plane of symmetry like a mirror being placed down the middle of that molecule, we'd have the same on left and right. And therefore, we have this plane of symmetry. And therefore, the, the environments that are on the left and the right of, of that benzene ring are actually the same. So I'm simply going to label it from top to bottom. So my top carbon, the CH3, the methyl group there, is, is carbon number one. The carbon that is uh, essentially at the top of that benzene ring is carbon number two. And then if we go down the sort of right-hand side, slightly below that is carbon number three. Now the carbon that is on the opposite side, directly kind of sort of 180 degrees left of that, um, is in the same environment because we said we had that plane of symmetry and if we have the plane of symmetry, the stuff on either side of it is in the same environment. So the, uh, that carbon, if essentially if we're going from top to bottom of that benzene ring, the carbons that are the second carbon down are the same on the left and the right. The same for the one what I've labelled number four, 
on the left and the right, both of those carbons are in the same environment because of the symmetry. And then finally, at the bottom, we just have that very bottom carbon, and that's what we're going to label number five. So if we were looking to assign a spectrum, there are a couple that are pretty easy to do. The first is the CH3 group. So if you go back to your table, you'll see that aromatic carbons tend to resonate at much, much different, much higher frequencies than just aliphatic carbons. And this is what we see. You can see that our CH3 group is all the way down at about 20 ppm. Our aromatic ones are all the way up at about 130 ppm. So the CH3 is a really simple one to do. We know that because it's just a CH3, a simple aliphatic hydrocarbon group, it's going to resonate at pretty low frequency. There's nothing to withdraw the electron density so far away. The only thing that's going to be withdrawing electron density here is the benzene ring, withdrawing electron density away from that carbon. And so our CH3 is slightly deshielded. It's around 20 ppm as opposed to normally being around maybe 5 or 10, but it's much lower down than the actual benzene ring carbons. Another one that's actually fairly easy to deduce is what carbon number two is. This is called a quaternary carbon because we have four other carbon groups, essentially the CH3 group and then the benzene carbons to the left and right, one of which is a single bond, one of which is a double bond. Essentially, we have four different group, uh, four carbon groups attached to this. This is called a quaternary carbon. And typically, these always have the lowest intensity um, of, of any of the peaks in the spectrum. So you can see those CH peaks for the benzene ring, three to five, are much higher in intensity. Typically, quaternary carbons tend to have um, much, much lower intensities. And so we can label number two as that peak at about 140. Then from just the data we've been given, it becomes a bit difficult to work out which are numbers three, four and five. They're typically going to be resonating at very, very similar frequencies. There are alternative NMR experiments you could do to be able to work out which one was which exactly. Um, but actually, in this case, it's good enough for just, just to be able to say that those peaks that are between about 130 and 125 they correspond to the aromatic carbons, so carbons three to five. Now, typically we do these NMRs in a solvent called CdCl3, deuterated chloroform. Now, the reason why it's carried out in deuterated solvents is because hydrogen is NMR active. We talked earlier about odd mass number nuclei being um, active, and one of them was H1, hydrogen. So what you don't want to do is do it in a solvent that contains hydrogen, because that would then start to interfere with your spectrum. You'd see lots of peaks for the hydrogen as well. And if you're looking at carbon NMR, if you used CdCl3, you always see a little triplet at 77 ppm. Now this is because deuterium is also spin active. It's got a slightly higher spin than hydrogen has, and so rather than just seeing a single peak, we actually see uh, what we call a triplet, three lines. So if you ever see that and you get confused and you think, oh, what is that? If you see it at around 77 ppm, three lines all of the same intensity, that's just the CdCl3 solvent. And so, of course, the key thing is that each peak on an NMR spectrum represents a non-identical carbon atom. So carbon number one is different to carbon number two, different to carbon number three, different to carbon number four, different to carbon number five. But the thing to really be aware of is that one peak could mean more than one carbon atom because there could be several carbon atoms that actually are in the same environment through this idea of symmetry. And so if you looked at this, you see there's five peaks, you might go, oh, my compound only has five carbons in it. But that's not necessarily true. We can see here for toluene that we have five peaks, but actually we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. Because the carbons that I've labeled three and four, there's also another carbon on the other side of that benzene ring that's in the same environment because of this, the plane of symmetry down the middle of that molecule. So always remember that peaks correspond to non-identical carbon atoms. They're in different environments, but the number of peaks doesn't always mean that's the number of carbons. And so the final example to look at here is a molecule called methyl methacrylate. We can see this is a pretty complicated molecule now. We have lots of different functional groups. We have an alkene in there. We have a carbonyl, we have C double bond O, C single bond O. So lots of different environments here. And the first thing would be to look for how many environments we'd expect to see. And so again, we're going to think about either kind of, imagine standing on every atom and do we see the same thing on, on either side? Um, or we can think about in terms of symmetry. Is there any symmetry in this molecule? Are there, are there any planes of symmetry? And you can hopefully see that there aren't any planes of symmetry in this molecule. It's a very, very asymmetric molecule. 
And so every single carbon atom is going to be in a different environment. And I've labelled them here one to five. So we can then start to think about which ones are going to be the most uh, de-shielded here. We talked about de-shielding as being very close to electronegative atoms quite often. And so here we can expect to see that our most de-shielded would probably be carbon number four. It's bound to two electronegative oxygens, a double bond to an oxygen, a single bond to an oxygen. It's very, very de-shielded. It's going to feel a big magnetic field uh, and therefore have a higher resonant frequency and um, therefore a higher chemical shift. And so at carbon number four, we'd expect to see our, our highest ppm, and we do roughly about 170 ppm. We can then start to look at some other um, some other peaks here. So I'm actually now going to move down to the, the, the right hand side of the spectrum. If we think about what is the least de-shielded or the most shielded group, it's probably going to be one of the, the CH3 groups. And if we look, we've got two CH3 groups, one that's bound to our electronegative oxygen, one that's bound just to our alkene. And while the alkene might de-shield slightly compared to just being a normal CH3 group on its own, clearly the one that is bound to the electronegative oxygen, carbon number five, is going to be more de-shielded than carbon number three because of that electronegativity difference and therefore de-shielding the carbon nucleus. And so therefore we can say that our, our most shielded peak is the carbon number three. And then the other, what we're told, another CH3 peak must be the carbon number five, slightly more de-shielded. Again, note that we also see our, our triplet here, the three lines of equal intensity for CdCl3 at about 77 ppm. And then that leaves us then with um, two peaks to deduce, one at about 135 and one at about 125. One of them must be the carbon atom on, to the right of the alkene and one of them must be the carbon atom on the left of the alkene. Now, one of the ways that we can deduce this, remember that we said uh, in a previous slide that quaternary carbons, carbons that are bonded to essentially no hydrogens on them or to other carbon groups, um, tend to have much lower intensities. And this is true here. So carbon atom number two, which is bonded to, to three other carbon atoms versus carbon number one, where we have two hydrogen atoms on it. You can see that carbon number two is that much lower intensity carbon and therefore the, the, the one at about 135 ppm. And therefore, our CH2 must also uh, must be therefore carbon number one and about 125 ppm. Another way to think about it is to think that carbon number two is closer to that ester group, the C double bondo, C single bondo, than carbon number one is. So we have that idea. It doesn't necessarily have to be directly bound to an electronegative atom. It can be just close to an electronegative atom. And clearly, carbon number two is closer to that electron withdrawing ester group uh, as opposed to carbon number one. And so carbon number two would be expected to be slightly more de-shielded than carbon number one, which is what we see. So time to have a go at some questions about carbon-13 NMR. So if you'd like to have a go, pause the video and the answers will be on the next slide. So I'm going to start over with the questions that are on the left. So we had compound K, which was studied using carbon-13 NMR. Give the number of peaks of the spectrum of K. So here we have to look at our molecule here, see whether we have um, any symmetry, essentially see how many environments we're going to have, how many different environments of carbons do we have. We look at our molecule and is there any symmetry in this molecule? And yes, there is. If we imagine the, between the two CH2 groups in the middle, a mirror plane going down the middle, a line of symmetry, we can see essentially they're mirror images of either side. So because we have this symmetry in the molecule, the CH3 groups that are either either end of the molecule are technically in the same environment. The CH2 groups that are in the middle are technically in the same environment and the carbons that double bond to the oxygen are technically in the same environment. And so K has three carbon-30 NMR peaks. We're then asked to use that table. So if, uh, go back to the pre one of the previous slides if you need the table um, to suggest a PPM value, a chemical shift value for the peak for the carbon atom labeled B. Now, if you look where labelled B is, B is actually a ketone carbon, so a car C double bondo with carbon groups on either side. And so here, this shift would probably be roughly around 200 ppm. Now, if we get told to suggest a value of the peak, don't just write down the, the range that's given in the table. Suggest something somewhere within that range. 
And then finally, to give the IUPAC name of K, remember that when we give our IUPAC name, we have to look for our longest carbon chain. The longest carbon chain is six carbons long. It's going to be based off a hexane chain. It's a keto, so remember that we use the suffix ON, O-O-O-N-E, for um, naming ketones. And then we have to number where our ketones are in the um, in the chain. And if we look, if we start from going from left to right, our keto is at carbon number two and at carbon number five. And so this would be hexane 2,5-dione. And then finally, the questions um, that are below and to the right. So we have uh, a tenolol. It's an example of uh, something of a beta blocker. And so we have the structure of it shown at the bottom. Uh, and then the carbon-13 spectrum that was recorded. Use the uh, structure to deduce the total number of peaks in the uh, carbon NMR spectrum. So we look at our molecule and we see, is there any symmetry of this molecule? And hopefully you can see, again, this is quite an asymmetric molecule. There isn't any symmetry in this molecule. So we're going to have quite a large number of peaks. And so typically, lots of these carbon atoms are in the same environment. So if I simply go from left to right, we have our carbonyl carbon as our first carbon atom. The next CH2 group, that's a different environment. We then have the first benzene carbon that we come to. That's another environment. We then have to be careful because technically there is actually symmetry within this benzene ring. And so we have the next carbons along both being in the same environment. The next two carbons along being both in the same environment. And then we reach the end of the benzene ring. That's another carbon. We then have the carbon atom, which has been labelled P. That's a different environment. The one to the right of that, a different environment. The one to the right of that, a different environment. And then we get to the end of our molecule. And we have this CH, CH3, CH3 section at the end. Now, a key thing to note here is that the carbon that's labelled the, the CH, that is one environment. But the two CH3 groups are actually equivalent environments. They are the same environment. What we can think about really is that we have free rotation around these carbon-carbon bonds. They're able to rotate, and so actually these, essentially these CH3 groups can essentially um, swap between each other. So if we labelled one A and B, they could rotate such that B is where A was and A was where B was. And so they technically are the same environment. And so if we total up the number of peaks, it comes to 11 peaks. We then said that one of the peaks is produced, um, so give the formula of the compound that is used as the standard. This is tetramethyl silane, TMS, uh, and the formula is CH3,4-SI, literally four methyl groups attached to a silicon, tetramethyl silane. Then we have one of the peaks is produced by the CH3 group labelled Q. Identify this peak in the spectrum and state its uh, PPM value. But if we look at our structure, the one that labelled Q, it's probably going to be one of the most shielded uh, groups. Typically, just CH3 groups tend to be fairly shielded. What's the CH3 bonded to? It's bonded to a CH group. Again, not very electronegative, so there's not going to be much de-shielding. And yes, that's then bonded to a nitrogen, but the actual CH3 groups are a couple of bonds away and so aren't going to be so affected by that. And so Q, actually, we can say is our, our lowest sort of peak. So ignoring, obviously, the one that's zero for TMS, the lowest shift peak uh, is uh, roughly about 22 ppm. And so that is the peak that we would see. Another way to sort of almost double check it is that actually the CH3 groups are the, um, they're the, the, they're the most furthest away from being a quaternary carbon. They have the most hydrogens attached that they possibly can. And so these are actually typically pretty intense peaks in the spectrum. And so as you can see there, the one at 22 actually is the highest peak. So that makes sense. And then we have three CH2 groups in the structure. One of them is labelled, uh, produces the peak at 71. Um, draw the circle around that CH2 group in the structure. So if we look for our peak here, we have our PPM peak at, at roughly 71, which is for, the, um, for one of these CH2 groups. So if we look at the CH2 groups that we have, we have our CH2 group, which is bonded to both our carbonyl group and our benzene ring. We have a CH2 group that is bonded to the nitrogen. And we have a CH2 group that is bonded to the oxygen uh, from the benzene ring. And essentially, we have to look um, back to our table to see which kind of range this fits into. And when we go back to our table, we see that that CH2 group um, is the one that I've circled in blue that I've labelled P. That's the one that produces the peak at 71 ppm. 
So thank you for watching this video. You can find many more videos like this on my YouTube channel. If you found the video helpful, please consider leaving a review on the tuition website. I offer online tuition for chemistry, so please check out my tuition pages for prices and how to contact me. And if you need any more help with your chemistry, you can always feel free to drop me an email. I'll be happy to help.